Why has Janine Jones's case garnered so much attention so many decades later? I trusted you with my daughter, and you would tell me it's going to be okay with Mary. You should have to serve one year for every year of life you robbed from the babies that you murdered. I often wonder how a person can sleep at night after taking so many helpless babies' lives. We all want to know why, and I don't know if we ever will. Janine Jones, who is known as the killer nurse, pleaded guilty to new murder charges this morning. Paul Venema, who's been following the Jones case since her initial conviction in 1984, tells us what he's learned about a possible plea deal. This all of it brings to a close a tragic saga that began over three decades ago. You know, some of this is, is a challenge to remember, but some of it is like it happened yesterday, simply because of the nature of the case. You know, certainly it was the most disturbing case I'd ever covered. How could you do something like this to an innocent child? You took Makad's most precious gift, babies, defenseless, innocent. It really hits you. It hits you. It, it could be, it could, it could have been my niece. It could have been anyone's child. To have a nurse who was charged with these crimes is, is certainly troubling. Because it's babies. No one expects someone to kill babies. You can't think of anything that's more innocent. For her to decide on her watch who lived and who died is nothing short of evil. Good evening and welcome to a special edition of KSAT News at 9. Tonight we are telling the story of Janine Jones, a woman for many synonymous with evil, a woman known as the killer nurse, and a woman now serving a life sentence in prison. Jones has been convicted of killing two infants by injecting them with powerful drugs while they were in her care in Kerrville and in San Antonio. She's suspected of killing dozens more babies, but it's highly unlikely she will ever be tried in all of the cases in which she's accused. That's because Jones is now serving a life sentence after she was convicted in a Bear County courtroom in January. She will not be eligible for parole until she is in her late 80s. This case has gripped and perplexed so many not only here in South Texas, but all across the country. How could one nurse allegedly kill infant after infant and why? In an effort to fully tell this story, we've relied on not only our own past reporting, but the reporting and memories of others connected to these cases. That list includes prosecutors, legal and medical experts, our own Paul Venema, San Antonio Express News courthouse reporter Elizabeth Zavala, and journalist Peter Elkind. Throughout this show, you'll see passages taken from Elkind's 1989 book about Janine Jones, The Death Shift. Tonight, we're starting from the beginning, Jones's beginning as a nurse who was hired to help. She was a very polarizing Figure, a very divisive figure. There were some nurses, quite a number of nurses, who um, were first very impressed with her technical skill. Well, they said she, and this was a quote, she said uh, she could establish an IV in a fly. I mean, she was just really, really good. She protested mightily that she was always on the side of the parents and the kids and how she was fighting the doctors you know, to do the right thing for the kids. There were grounds to have fired her totally aside from her harming kids. She came in one day drunk and started messing with uh, patients' medical equipment. She was insubordinate. Um, she grabbed a dead child's body away from the parents and ran down the hallway. 
There was a, a, just an array, a litany of horrible behavior. The kids who were being treated at Bear County Hospital um, were in an ICU, and they were already very, very sick. And so it was harder to isolate that you know, something terrible was being done to them. You know, these were not privileged kids and privileged families who had an option to um, be treated anywhere they wanted. You know, their kids were in terrible shape. Um, they were desperately poor. They faced all the greatest burdens that you know, impoverished folks in our society do. so effusive in the, her efforts to ingratiate herself with the parents and um, develop relationships with them and appear to be more caring than any, any other nurse, that a lot of them found her very charming and, you know, grateful for the attention that she was lavishing upon them. She came under suspicion because she happened to be the nurse who was on duty at the time that children were dying. And there are some people that remained in their camp, but the larger number of nurses um, and doctors began to suspect her. There was a strong correlation between her shifts and the deaths that occurred. Because this pattern was so dramatic of kids who had done well under other nurses, done well under other shifts, having emergencies when Janine was on duty and caring for these kids. I mean, to the extent that they literally called the shift she worked, the 3 to 11 shift, they began calling it the death shift, which is as chilling as it gets. In Rolando Santos's case, heparin was, um, heparin was the drug that was used. Heparin is a drug that interferes with blood clotting. It's a blood thinner and it's usually used in people that have some type of clotting disorder. The problem with any of these drugs is that they are therapeutic in the correct levels, but when, um, when a nurse, uh, such as Janine Jones, is in the position to use these drugs and to take, she can take the drugs and she can inject uh, these babies with a large amount of those drugs, uh, the babies in their, with, their, with the way that their infant bodies reacted to it um, would, would cause these problems that you would see. If you were to inject heparin into someone who didn't have a clot, it's just going to cause massive internal bleeding. You will see things like bleeding out of places they shouldn't bleed from, uh, their eyes, their ears, their nose. Normally, if you have any kind of just minor injury, your blood just clots and fixes it. But if you're on a blood thinner, then it can't do that. And so even just a tiny nick or cut it can be a huge emergency. If there was an old IV line that was run through or they have old needles, uh, needle marks that had healed, will open up and blood will come through those. In Rolando's case, it was extremely horrifying. That was one of the reasons that the, Dr. Copeland, who was, the, um, who was a young medical uh, resident who had just kind of finished his education and was just starting to be a doctor, um, out of everybody there, he realized pretty quick that it wasn't something that was naturally happening. It was something that somebody was doing. This was Rolando Santos who was being attacked. The doctor could see from the symptoms that somebody was intentionally poisoning him with heparin. And based upon that, Dr. Copeland in the Rolando Santos case was able to give Rolando a cure called protamine. And protamine just does the reverse of what heparin does. The issue with that was is that uh, protamine could have hurt the baby very badly if heparin wasn't the problem. And so uh, Dr. Copeland had to take a big risk and it turned out that it, it worked out exactly as he thought and he was able to save Rolando's life. Dr. Holland, who was a, a brand new uh, pediatrician, just opened her practice, was, was in search of a nurse, and, and hired Janine Jones uh, immediately for her pediatric clinic in Kerrville. And 
Within a period of one month, eight kids had nine separate emergencies and were rushed to the ER because they had stopped breathing. That was pretty hard to miss. Many children under their care had been developing some respiratory issues. In each case, uh, Janine Jones would, would somehow uh, bring these children uh, out of whatever episode they were dealing with. Their medical problems went from zero to, you know, 120 miles an hour, um, you know, in an instant. Uh, they came in with colds and flus, flu and uh, for a routine baby checkup or shot, and suddenly they stopped breathing. As I recall, the way it surfaced here in Kerrville is that we had the, a death of a child, Chelsea McClellan. Other physicians were saying, this is not normal. This is not what happens in a physician's office. In Kerrville, in the St. Peterson Hospital, the little hospital there, they usually see retirees. They don't see kids. What had happened is that uh, Chelsea McClellan had suffered what had been described as a respiratory arrest in the office of Dr. Kathleen Holland. She had been transported to Sid Peterson Hospital. And of course, there was a, a code called uh, over the hospital loudspeaker that basically was, you know, any medical personnel in the area respond to the code. And uh, so happens that one of the physicians that responded, uh, a man named Dr. Frank Bradley, who was an anesthesiologist. Uh, an anesthesiologist identified the pattern of behavior from the child as though she were coming out from a drug called succinylcholine. As they were bringing Chelsea McClellan in, Dr. Bradley observed and commented that it looked to him as though the child was coming out from under the effects of succinylcholine, which was a drug that he administered routinely as a form of anesthesia. Succinylcholine is a muscle paralytic that is usually used to paralyze someone's muscles for surgery or if they have to be intubated or something like that. Um, if you were to inject it in a person, in a baby, um, it would just paralyze all of their muscles, including the diaphragm, which is the muscle that you have to use to breathe. So it would essentially just stop respiration and then probably they would go into cardiac arrest as a result. If you injected succinylcholine into anyone, it would cause this widespread paralysis of their muscles, which is why it's normally used in a hospital and you have to be under very careful monitoring by an anesthesiologist to make sure that you're not going to die. That's what made people all of a sudden pay attention. What is this drug? What's this child getting this drug for? And then the investigation began. Inquiries are made in Dr. Holland's office and they find out that in fact she did have succinylcholine in her office. It had been ordered by her nurse, Janine Jones. Upon inspection, Dr. Holland is saying that she has never prescribed it. She then checked her supply of succinylcholine and found that there had been a bottle of, of a vial of succinylcholine missing. She asked uh, Jones about it. She said, I don't know what happened to it. Just say we lost it. Later, the bottle didn't turn up. One of the vials had, in fact, been opened and it had puncture holes in the stopper. Indicating that somebody had, with a needle, taken some succinylcholine out of that. And the contents of that bottle was all saline solution. She immediately became suspicious when she started putting two and two together. So she uh, turned that vial over to Texas Rangers and that's how, how that, that, uh, that began to tie Jones into the, uh, into the death of, of Chelsea McClellan. Then the problem began as we understood the way that succinylcholine worked is that it began breaking up in the body almost immediately. So if used correctly, very safe. Used incorrectly, potentially deadly, but also very hard to find. 
So then the next step began to be, how can we prove that this child was in fact given that drug? The child was uh, given uh, an autopsy because of the way the death occurred. And the initial autopsy report came back as sudden infant death syndrome. It wasn't until later when the possibility of succinylcholine being introduced that the medical examiner's office went back and said, wait a minute, all bets are off. I know that we learned of a man named Dr. Bo Homestead, who uh, was a doctor in Sweden and worked at the Karolinski Institute, who reportedly had the ability to detect succinylcholine in the body. He developed a method where uh, succinylcholine, which is a muscle relaxant, could be identified in uh, embalmed body tissue. They, embalmed, they, they uh, exhumed little Chelsea's body once this investigation began and took samples. He, uh, he uh, analyzed those samples and was able to identify the presence of succinylcholine. So that, that gave uh, authorities who were investigating the opportunity to, to uh, look to try to find where the succinylcholine uh, came from. That led them, of course, to Dr. Holland's office. We then pursued exhumation, knowing that we had somebody that would test the tissue. And that's a day I, that I won't forget. I mean, I, I still remember it very well. I was 30 uh, or so years old and single and, and no children. I really hadn't put a lot of thought into what I was getting ready to do at that point in time. The first thing that I noticed immediately was the smell. Uh, and I know that's difficult to say, but uh, that was my first experience with smelling decomposition. It was very unnerving for me. I wasn't sure what to expect, and I felt very strongly that I needed to participate in every aspect of this. But boy, I was having second thoughts about it at that time. And it was like seeing a large doll on a table uh, with a stuffed animal and a baby blanket. And I remember having to remind myself that that's not a doll, that's a human being. And I can tell you where at the cemetery it happened, I can tell you what people were wearing, I can tell you where I parked the car. It stuck with me that much. It, it, was, a, it, was, a, it was a traumatic day. After the presence of succinylcholine was found in Chelsea McClellan's tissue, Janine Jones was charged with murder and injury to a child. As the Kerrville investigation was underway, Bear County had an investigation of its own. Ultimately, Bear County turned over just one indictment for injury to a child in the Rolando Santos case. By the time we tried this case, we were well aware of the attention it was receiving and did not have any idea of the implications of it, but we knew that it was being watched nationwide. I remember reading about Janine Jones when I would come home from college. I began to, you know, follow that as a student journalist and it was the talk of my parents' home whenever I would come home. We tried this case in Georgetown. We were in the small courtroom. It was packed every day. This was so troubling because the victim was a 15-month-old child, and, and that just made it extremely painful, if you will, personally, uh, from a personal standpoint, difficult trial to cover. Ron was able to convince a judge to let us talk about all of those other incidents so we weren't having to deal with one incident involving Chelsea McClellan. We were able to show a pattern of behavior with several different children. It was from January, four, a four week trial began mid January and didn't wrap up until mid February. So it was in the, the heart of winter and it was really a, 
from a, a miserable trial to cover. Now having children and grandchildren of my own, to see that behavior of a person who was a parent herself, I can't imagine. I can't imagine that it would not have ripped her guts out for this to have happened to these children. I did not see that. I did not see that. Now, I don't know what I was expecting to see, but whatever it was, I didn't see it in her. The testimony of Chelsea McClellan's mother, Petty McClellan, it was just gut-wrenching. Petty McClellan takes the stand and basically describes the day of uh, what had happened earlier that day. She had to tell how she had taken her daughter to the clinic in Kerrville, Dr. Uh, Kathleen Holland, Holland's clinic, for just a routine checkup. Why were they going to the doctor? There wasn't anything wrong with Chelsea, as I recall. It was a routine checkup. She brought her in there. She was given two, what she was told were routine shots by, by Janine Jones, Dr. Dr. Holland's nurse. She had been a premature baby, but you know, so she was being monitored a little more closely. Uh, and then all, literally for them, all hell broke loose. And within just seconds after that, and this is according to the testimony of, of uh, Petty McClellan, and like I say, I, I, I can almost hear it to this day. Petty is walking through this step at a time, and then of course as we get to the respiratory arrest, the trip to the hospital, the ambulance ride, it becomes more and more intense. She said she suddenly went limp, in her words, like a rag doll. She said it was, she just went limp, and she said she looked up, her daughter looked up at her and looked right in, in the eyes and was whimpering and was trying to say, Mama, but couldn't get it out. Petty is uh, having more and more difficulty telling us about the situation. She's very, very emotional, very choked up, a lot of difficulty in talking. You can tell that she's one step away from being sick. Uh, she's crying, she's sobbing profusely. If you looked around the courtroom, there was not a dry eye in that courtroom. Everyone was crying. All of the jurors were crying, the judge was crying, the audience was crying. Everyone was crying, except Janine Jones. And they, the jury, in a four-week trial, you would expect some uh, lengthy deliberations. The jury deliberated just a little bit north of, of three hours before they found her guilty, and uh, about the same amount of time before they sentenced her to 99 years in prison. A lot of people ask, well, why didn't she get the death penalty for killing this child, Chelsea? Um, and the problem was is that it was not a capital crime to kill a baby until 1993. Ronnie Sutton was the prosecutor out there in Kerrville. And he said that the jury at the time said that if they could have given her the death penalty, they would have. They just couldn't. Jones was convicted in October that, that year of 1984. Uh, a jury here in Bear County uh, convicted uh, Jones of injury to a child in the uh, Santos case, and she was uh, given an, an additional 60 years in prison. By this time, we were then aware of some of the history in Bear County and some of the things that might have taken place there and realized that we were the last stop in a very long train ride and that there is no telling what damage uh, Janine Jones had caused. It is a question that has been asked for decades now. Did Bear County Hospital, which would later become University Hospital, respond appropriately to the suspicious pediatric deaths in the ICU? Although the hospital has never been formally charged for mishandling the situation, many suspect a cover-up is part of the reason why it took so long for Janine Jones to face punishment for her crimes in the San Antonio area. Our own Dylan Collier explains. Beyond Janine Jones and you know her psychology and um, you know, despicable behavior, um, were people who known better who should have interceded to stop her. 
Her shift at Bear County Hospital was dubbed the death shift back in the early 1980s. Janine Jones was accused of giving deadly injections to more than a dozen babies, but she was never disciplined by the hospital, which begs the question, why? It was the nursing hierarchy um, in, the, in the medical center hospital. The doctors, the nursing administrators, the hospital administrators, the medical school officials who knew she was had every reason to believe she was harming kids under her care, um, but refused to do the right thing, who failed to stop her and allowed her to continue to harm kids and go off to Kerrville, where she murdered one child, injured seven others. Several hospital staff members noticed a remarkable spike in deaths and emergencies of children under Jones's care and raised the issue with administrators. Complaints led to several investigations, but investigations did not lead to disciplinary action. In fact, author Peter Elkind reported that San Antonio law enforcement officers weren't made aware of the issue until after the investigation began in Kerrville. The hospital administration at that time was extremely fearful of lawsuits and they felt as if, based upon what we've read, they felt as if they called Jones out or fired her, then attention would be drawn to the fact that there was an abnormal um, amount of, of baby deaths on that floor. Jones was not let go for the suspicious deaths. Instead, there was another response. They intentionally, um, what looks like intentionally, created a plan uh, to get rid of all of the LVNs, which would include Janine Jones, and I guess with the thought that if they did that, it wouldn't draw attention specifically to her. Ms. Jones was given a letter of recommendation from the hospital saying that she was an asset to the hospital, that she would be an asset to any other place that she worked, and that she was not leaving or being fired because of any bad performance, but because they were reorganizing the unit. That letter of recommendation was forwarded to Kathleen Holland, who of course went on to employ her in Kerrville, where several children experienced medical emergencies while under Jones's care, and Chelsea McClellan was killed after being injected with succinylcholine. Jones was convicted more than 30 years ago of killing at least one of the babies and is set to be released from prison next year. People need to understand that when someone receives a sentence of life in prison, it doesn't mean life in prison. It always means that there will be a possibility of parole. And in some cases, there will be a required parole release date. At the time, uh, 99 years didn't mean 99 years, didn't mean a life sentence because of the overcrowding situation. That law is sometimes referred to as mandatory release law. What it says, in effect, is that a person who has served a certain portion of a sentence is entitled to be released if they have been on good behavior during the time that they were in prison. Now that law came about because of severe prison overcrowding in Texas. It operated in the early 80s, particularly during the time of the Janine Jones conviction, in a way that required the release of prisoners, even people committed for murder, after they had served a certain amount of a sentence, plus had credit for good behavior. This seemed like a story from long ago. And then lo and behold, um, Janine Jones, a suspected serial killer, was sentenced to 99 years in one case and 60 years in another, um, was about to go free after 35 years, which is not a short amount of time, but certainly not what people expected. I used to be the, the court chief in the 437th and uh, district court, and I had an investigator there named Larry DeHaven who um, talked to me early on after he had seen me try a few cases. He said, you know, I'd really like somebody to look at these Janine Jones cases. He said, look, you know, this nurse had killed 60 babies and she's gonna be released if somebody doesn't do something about it. And it was about a year and a half later, or a year later, that, um, <laughs> that I was actually, I was watching uh, Forensic Files. on one of those shows, and the show was about Janine Jones. It was at that time as I kind of, it renewed my interest and I was able, I really had some time that I could work on it, that I went to Nico and I talked to him about it, and I said, look, I'd really like an opportunity to look into this and to see what we can do because her release date's coming up pretty quick. And 
they dug up about 27 boxes that had dust on them and hadn't seen the light of day for about 30 years. Um, and we just opened them up and then I started working from about 5 p.m. to midnight uh, for about a year and a half. Um, every day after work, I would just go through those boxes, categorize them, figure it out, see what cases there were. Um, and there were, you know, just medical records and grand jury testimonies and all kinds of things. So once we got a good handle on that, we ended up finding five cases that I believe that we could prove beyond a reasonable doubt at trial that, that Janine Jones murdered those babies. 5 p.m. to midnight every day after serving as the chief prosecutor for a felony court. That's right. That's, yeah. that's extreme dedication. Why is it so important to you? The first mother I talked to uh, when we were still kind of getting it going was Patty McClellan, who was just an incredibly strong, inspiring person. After talking to Patty, um, I realized that it's not theoretical. It's, it's real people that have, real, um, that have a real stake in it, and there was a lot of stakeholders. Today, a new murder indictment. She was indicted on two cases uh, in, during the summer of 2017. And then uh, a couple of months later, she was indicted in, in more cases. A new charge against a convicted murderer known as the Angel of Death. As Dylan Collier reports, it's the first charge against Jones in more than 30 years, but it may not be the last. In other news, she's suspected of killing up to 60 babies, but could be a free woman in less than a year. The Bear County District Attorney appears to be bound and determined to not let that happen. Nico LaHood announcing two more murder indictments against Janine Jones, the so-called angel of death. Months from her projected release date from prison, so-called killer nurse Janine Jones facing a new fifth murder indictment. Jones now charged with the 1981 death of infant Paul Villarreal. Prosecutors worked tirelessly to keep Jones in prison. They succeeded. But throughout this entire ordeal, one question has lingered. Why? Why did Jones kill innocent babies? It is a question that everyone connected to this case, from prosecutors to the victims' families to reporters who've covered this story, to our entire community have asked, and decades later are still asking. There's no apparent motive, even after all of these years, there's no obvious reason why she would have done this other than to exercise power and control over these helpless patients who were in her care. I buy into what's called the, the uh, now called the Munchausen syndrome, in which uh, it's a, a hero complex, if you will. You get somebody real close to death, and then voila, you you're magically, through your skills, bring them back to life, revive them again. I think she is an example of what's of a syndrome that's been described by, uh, by experts as Munchausen syndrome by proxy. I think the problem is much, was much deeper, and is much deeper than some hero complex. I think she had no emotion. I mean, she understood that other people were upset. She understood somebody else lost a child. Other than that, did it affect her? As far as I could tell, no. When you hear of something like this happening, any kind of serial killing, you immediately think, well, it must be the product of some kind of mental illness. And I guess that probably is, is one of the, the things that piques everybody's interest is the fact that we all want to know why, and I don't know if we ever will. Janine Jones' path from nurse to convicted child killer to the present day took another turn in January of this year when she pleaded guilty to the murder of 11-month-old Joshua Earl Sawyer. R.J. Marquez walks us through the events that led up to that plea agreement that finally gave some of the families of the Bear County babies a sense of closure. 
Jones initially pleaded not guilty to baby deaths in Bear County and wanted to have those cases dismissed. That request was denied in April of 2018. Prosecutor Jason Goss testified during a hearing in April of 2018 that a letter written by a prison inmate had claimed that Jones admitted to the crimes. Goss said that in that letter, the prison inmate wrote that she did not want Jones to get parole. The inmate also claimed that Jones had told her that she did not kill the babies. The voices in Jones' head did. I did obtain um, much more recently information about, things, first of all, a letter that she had sent to the nursing board where she offered what appeared to be a semi-confession, um, you know, saying that uh, she had indeed done heinous things. Um, she was a little vague, but, but it seemed to be a confession. Also, uh, and there was testimony in court um, in the run-up to the, the trials that she had um, more or less confessed to, uh, to a parole board, parole employee at the prison system, uh, said, uh, you know, wait a second, there's something else I want to tell you. Uh, you know, I, I really did harm these babies. Last September, a battle over Jones's Bible loomed over the case. The Bible was seized during the sweep of Jones's cell. Jones wanted the Bible back, but prosecutors at the time said that it had value to their case. There are some ref some handwriting of Janine Jones in her Bible, some references to children, to sin, to sort of a variety of things. I did the worst thing, in quotes. Gave it all away to Satan. Today, underlined, I take it back. What is, what is that referencing? You know, I don't know. Months later, Jones would make a plea deal with prosecutors. She pleaded guilty to Joshua Sawyer's death in 1981. Petty would say she's never going to admit her guilt. She wants everybody to know that she's the smartest person in the room. So the fact that she was able to admit that she killed Joshua Sawyer was huge for them. It was something that they never thought. You took God's most precious gift, babies, defenseless, innocent. That's what they wanted from the outset, and that is to make sure that Jones never again takes a breath outside prison. She's a chilling, chilling person to this day to look at. And quite frankly, aside from what the, the passage of time has done to her physical appearance, she doesn't appear any different than she did over 30 years ago covering the trial. She's, she's just got almost a blank look about her. As part of the plea agreement, the charges in the deaths of four other babies were dismissed. But the victims' families found some peace knowing that Jones will likely spend her very last days in prison. They had a chance to address her in what's called a victim impact statement. My sister Teresa and I, as well as the rest of our family, are glad today that you will never see daylight as a free woman and your life will end in captivity for killing my son Joshua Earl Sawyer. So I will leave you with this. I hope for you to live a long and miserable life Goodbye. I trusted you with my daughter, and you would tell me it's going to be okay, Rosemary. My baby girl, Rosemary, never had a chance in life to go to school, to get married, and to have my grandbaby. I pray to God you never come up to her. No more babies in the world. Forty years have gone by since you took my baby's life, and I hate you for that. And I often wonder how a person can sleep at night after taking so many helpless babies' lives. You must have a very large black heart. At this point, I'm not saying that I forgive you. There is only one person we must answer to, and that is God. The mothers of the children prosecutors say were killed by Janine Jones have formed an unbreakable bond. What they have lived through, the death of a baby, and then learning that child could have been murdered. All common experiences that none of them wanted, but ones that have left them clinging to each other for support. It has been their collective goal to see Jones spend the rest of her life in prison. It is that bond and that goal that were the subject of so many stories by San Antonio Express News Courthouse reporter Elizabeth Zavala. It was, it was probably one of the most amazing things that I've seen. 
Many times they would um, sit in, in the benches in the court with their arms locked or if someone would start crying, they would put an arm around someone, but they immediately to me appeared to be a united front. Petty had a lot of guilt regarding the San Antonio babies, as she called them. She had a lot of guilt because she said, Bear County didn't do right by the moms. Petty, in a sense, became like the guide for these women these women gravitated to her like, like, their her like their heroine, really, their hero, because of everything that she had gone through. This wasn't book club. This wasn't girls' night out. This wasn't let's go to happy hour. This was a bond that was created by the tragic loss of their babies, with the common denominator being Janine Jones. Two of the mothers died before Jones was sentenced to life in prison. We talked to the daughter of one of those women. Her mother, Juanita Villarreal, passed away in December. Melissa Luna was in court the day that Jones pleaded guilty in this most recent case. There for not only her mother, but the older brother she never knew. She passed on December 11th, the morning of December 11th. She was pronounced at uh, 5.30 a.m. Melissa Luna never expected to say goodbye to her mother the way that she did. At 64 years old, Juanita Villarreal had a sudden onset of pneumonia. Her body shut down and she died in hospice care just days later. And I held her hand the whole night and um, she, um, I'm sorry. I, I, I just couldn't, I had to hold her hand. You know, I was trying, I had to let her know. That was my way of being able to let her go to say, hey, you're not alone. Luna had been by her mother's side long before she took her last breath. She was her mother's companion in court, helping Villarreal, who spoke mostly Spanish, understand each legal step in the case against her son's accused killer, Janine Jones. This one just, it hurts to see this one. Villarreal's son, Paul, died September 24th, 1981. He was four months old. A baby in a casket for anybody, you know, whatever the cause was, it's hard, you know, and to know that he was murdered. Paul was born with a deformed skull and had been in the hospital following surgery to correct it. Luna says her mother was told the procedure was a success. She was told to go home the day that he died. She was told, hey, you know, um, everything's okay. He's gonna be taken care of, you know, and he'll, he's gonna go home, he'll be fine. But hours later. They call her and they're like, hey, you need to come to the hospital, your son's dead. Luna says her mother never got clear answers after Paul's death or even a chance to talk to a doctor. She was told her son had a heart problem. Decades later, prosecutors would allege Janine Jones injected baby Paul with a powerful drug that killed him. A mother knows, a mother knows, so she just, she knew. She knew that my brother didn't just die. She knew that something had happened to him. Growing up, Luna says her mother didn't talk much about losing Paul, but it's been a heartache that her family has always known. It's been hard not knowing what could have been, you know, I mean, especially being that he was an older brother. I, I don't know what our relationship would have been like. It, it hurts, it really hurts. As she got older, she didn't really smile as much in her pictures, so. I love this picture of her. We first talked to Luna in December, weeks before Jones was supposed to go to trial. She planned to be in court, sitting alongside the loved ones of Jones' other alleged victims. I mean, all of, all of us, all of our biggest goals is to have her take her last breath in prison. As we know now, when that day in court came, there would be no trial. Jones took a plea deal and was sentenced to life in prison in return. We talked to Luna again that day. She came out of the courtroom smiling. I can walk out with a smile on my face because even though my brother is in a box, she's gonna spend the rest of her life in a box too. So I, I can smile today knowing that. And so a life sentence in prison becomes the likely conclusion to what has been a heart-wrenching, unexplainable part of San Antonio and Hill Country history. 
We thank you for joining us for this special edition of KSAT News at 9 and special thanks to all who shared their stories. Thank you.